the concept of a genocide is revolting to any sane person. When people hear about events like the Holocaust, they are led to ask questions such as, why do entire people groups or governments let genocides happen? What has gotten into the minds of the perpetrators to be able to commit such atrocities? These questions are not inappropriate to ask, for God has given every man a moral conscience that recognizes that the killing of an entire people group is wrong. However, what these people neglect to remember is that man is by nature corrupt, and this evil nature can drive a man to do all kinds of evil to his fellow man. However, for man to go as far as committing the vehement crime of genocide takes something more than just his corrupt nature. This greater influence is often one of the most simplistic tools of the human race. Words. Rhetoric, as defined by Aristotle, is the faculty of discovering, in a given situation, all of the available means of persuasion. In other words, rhetoric is the art of persuasion. Those who have good rhetorical skills use selective phrasing, tone, and timing to convince people to agree with them. Because of this, rhetorical skills are extremely powerful, and it often influences both public opinions and individual private thoughts. When these skills are used by the right people, such as Sir Winston Churchill and Martin Luther King Jr., societies can grow and improve. However, when these abilities are misused, people can be manipulated in order for the user to advance an agenda and to cover it up. These agendas usually include covering up a lie, seeking financial prosperity, or gaining a higher position of influence. But the most extreme cases often lead to crimes against humanity, most notably genocide. Today, we will look at three of the most brutal genocides and show you how rhetoric was involved in each one. Perhaps the greatest example of the misuse of rhetoric is the Nazi party. Following their defeat in World War I, Germany was forced to agree to brutally harsh compensation treaties. These punishments ruined Germany's economy, and its citizens were required to look for work and food. It was this setting that Adolf Hitler used to come to power because he gave the cause of German depravity a face, the Jews. Throughout history, the Jews had been the recipients of much persecution. Being labeled as the killers of Christ, many historical figures defamed the Jewish religion. For example, Reformation leader Martin Luther is found saying that they are nothing but thieves and robbers who daily eat no morsel and wear no thread of clothing that they have not stolen and pilfered from us by means of their accursed usury. However, the hatred of the Jewish religion eventually turned into the hatred of the Jewish race when anti-Semitism emerged in the late 1800s. Before World War I, however, the anti-Semitic groups in Germany were not popular, being able to only gain about 4% of the vote in a national election. This changed by the time Hitler rose to power. By this point, the people of Germany were desperate. The Weimar Republic the first attempt to rebuild Germany had failed. As the leader of the Nazi party, Hitler used methodical phrasing and a passionate tone in his speeches to the people of Germany, who were suffering in a time of economic and political depression, that he would restore Germany to its former glory and make the German people gain superiority over all other people of the world. His rhetorical skills made him the hero of the people of Germany and, by 1934, he became the Fuhrer. Nazism permeated the flesh and blood of the people through single words, idioms, and sentence structures which were imposed on them in a million repetitions 
and taken on board mechanically and unconsciously. Along with his promise to restore Germany, Hitler also instilled in the people a hatred for the Jewish people. In his speeches, he often spoke about the purification of the German people from all other people, especially the Jews. The Nazi soldiers also convinced the German people to stop shopping at Jewish stores, and public humiliation of Jews was encouraged. Some visual rhetoric that was implemented was the requirement for the Jews to wear a golden star, as well as a variety of propaganda posters that portrayed Jews as a menace to society. Philip Muir, a survivor of Auschwitz, describes one of the victims of this propaganda. I often wondered how it was possible for this young man, scarcely older than myself, to be so cruel, so brutal, harboring so unfathomable a hatred of the Jews. He was no doubt a victim of that Nazi propaganda which put the blame for any misfortune, including the war, on the Jews. How is it possible, I often asked myself, for a young man of average intelligence and normal personality to carry out the unspeakable atrocities demanded of him without ever realizing that he was being used as a tool by perverted political dictators. One of the most disturbing examples of visual rhetoric is the Nazi propaganda film, The Eternal Jew. Here is a sample that presents its main message. This film strategically uses camera angles, facial expressions, and metaphors to convince the Germans that the Jews are different. The cameras are always angled down on the Jews to show them as insignificant and inferior. The actors give Jews malicious or sneaky expressions, indicating that they are prone to thievery and they are also compared to rats or infectious disease to convince people that they are parasitic and should be eradicated. Eventually, the ultimate result of all of these twisted rhetorical tools convinced many young men to join Hitler's cause and kill six million Jews during the Holocaust. About 30 years after the end of World War II, similar rhetorical skills were abused in Cambodia. In the midst of the Vietnam War, the government of Cambodia allowed the communist North Vietnamese to set up camps on the border of their country in order to gain land advantages against South Vietnam. Because of this, the United States bombed Cambodia. The radical communist group in Cambodia, the Khmer Rouge, used this event as an opportunity to speak against capitalism and advocate communism. Eventually, this rebel group overthrew the Cambodians and developed its own twisted, controlling system called the Anchor. This new society forced its people to lose their former names, and Sir and Ma'am were replaced by Comrade. The people were also forced to evacuate the cities initially being convinced that the United States was going to bomb them. After being relocated to inadequate farm huts, they were promised that the Yanker was going to create a new agrarian society where there are no crimes, no deceit, no trickery, and no Western influence. In order to set up this society, the Khmer Rouge used forced labor to try to feed the people and nightly sessions to brainwash them to believe that the former glory of Cambodia could be obtained. A Cambodian that went through this genocide as a child, Lao Ung, writes about one of the victims of this brainwashing. Matt Bong says he is the one responsible for bringing the Khmer Rouge to power. He is the one who will restore Kampuchewa to its ancient glory. Matt Bong's voice rises as she speaks his name, as if uttering Pol Pot brings her closer to his power. For those who did not agree with this new setup, 
repeated sayings such as, no gain in keeping, no loss in weeding out, and he who protests is an enemy, he who opposes is a corpse, were used to make its civilians believe that killing off those who oppose the anchor or those who are not Cambodian was justifiable. The dehumanizing language used contributed to the two million deaths that occurred in the Cambodian genocide. The final genocide that will be presented today will be the Rwandan genocide. Similar to the Jews in Germany, the Tutsi people were often viewed by the Hutus as a race of people that did not belong in Rwanda. Although there was often tension or class differences between these two groups, there was no clear indication between the two people groups until every Rwandan was registered a Hutu or a Tutsi on an identification card. The ultimate event that brought about the killings, however, was in April 1994, where the Hutu president was killed in a plane crash. The Hutu extremists used this timing to promote the massacre of the Tutsis. Fergal Keane, a British journalist who witnessed the events of the Rwandan genocide, described the unique ways that the Hutu government promoted the genocide. On 6 April, the day of the plane crash, Radio Mill Collins told its audience that the Tutsis needed to be killed. The theme was to dominate the system's broadcast for weeks. The official state radio was the only marginally less virulent, constantly calling on the Hutus to rise up and defend Rwanda against the invasion of the Anyenzi, or cockroaches. Several privately owned newspapers and journals were harnessed for the task of disseminating hate propaganda. Because many people in Rwanda could not read, the radio proved to be the most effective rhetorical tool used by the Hutu extremists to persuade the people to kill the Tutsis. They phrased this act as defending Rwanda from the cockroaches. The Hutu used the term cockroach because it indicated that the Tutsis were not wanted in the country, and whatever one might think of him as an individual, is part of a group he can never leave. Other euphemisms such as work for murder, and tools for machetes and clubs, were also used, and the radios even reported of locations where Tutsis were hiding in order for the Hutus to carry out their final solution. These persuasion over radio stations caused the death of approximately 800,000 Tutsis and moderate Hutus in only 100 days. The Rwandan Genocide, the Cambodian Genocide, and the Holocaust each present a different story but they all share a similar point of origin. The twisted use of rhetoric. Phrasing, tone, and timing were used to bring about great evil. Because of this, rhetoric is generally viewed as a means to sway the crowd and gain power, a faulty method of seeking truth and understanding, or a vehicle for deception and opportunism. However, to persuade you from learning rhetorical skills is not the point of this documentary. It was words that God used to bring everything into existence, and he has also blessed man with the gift of language. If he did not want us to use them for a specific purpose, he would not have given them to us. However, we warn you to be wise about what you say, for we are commanded to let no corrupt talk come out of your mouths, but only such as good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear.